So we begin with the altruistic motivation. All mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Dagla dang wa je pe dra no pa je pe ge. Dar pa dang tam she ken pe pa du jo pa je pa tam she ki so je pe. Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang den. Dug now dang drel nor du la na me pa yang dag pa zog pe zang ju brin po she do pa ja. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. They say, do sang ma ge gi ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Ma she ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. Do de ring ne sung te ni ma sang ta sam gi ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Transcend Sawa Dangu Pa Je Pe Pal Dan Lama Dam Pa Nam La Kab Su Chi O Yidam Kil Gor Gi La Sog Nam La Kab Su Chi O Sange Chom Den De Nam La Kab Su Chi O Dam Pe Cho Nam La Kab Su Chi O Pa pe ge du nam la kab su chi o. Pa wo ka jo cho kyong song me song yes ye gi cheng dang dem pa nam la kab su chi o. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. <clears throat> Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas, I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas, as the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. 
Shang Chu Ning Po Chi Ki Bar Sang Nam La Kab Su Chi Cho Dang Shang Chu Sam Pa Yi So Klang De Shin Kab Su Chi Zitar Nong Ki De Shagi Shang Chu Tug Ni Ki Pa Dang Shang Chu Sam Pe La Pa La De Tag Rim Shin E Pa Tar De Shin Dro La Pen Dan Du Shang Chu Sam Ni Ki Ki Shing De Shin Du Ni La Pa La Rim pa shin du la pa ji o. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye cho dang so ki cho nam la Shang shu ba du dagni kab su chi Dagi jin so ki pe so nam gi Dro la pen sangye ju pa sho May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang de we gur dang dem pa jor chi. Dug now dang du now gi gu dang dra wa jor chi. Dog now may pay de wa dung be draw wa jorchi. May ring chag dung ni dung draw way, tang nam la ne pa jorchi. Page 12, please. The Sagaramati requested sutra in English. Likewise, be extinguished, extinguished all enemies to my purpose. Whatever evil forces are in me, be defeated. Do this so that when I am victorious, all pure radiance melts into me, completely purified. Take all this knowledge, food and drink peacefully. Enjoy it and be satisfied so that all obstacles may be destroyed. Be liberated from all obstacles all general obstacles. Maras are defeated by this gesture of the Buddha. By reciting this mantra, may all the Maras be purified. As a result, may all the Maras be defeated. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments, something you want to talk about before we get started? Okay, uh, I have um, two announcements. First is that um, we're going to consolidate our Zoom so that going forward, this Zoom that we're on now, this Zoom link is going to be the Monday night Buddhism 101 Zoom. 
So we'll be using this one Zoom for all our functions. So for the Medicine Buddha on Thursday night, for the Monday night, and for the Sunday, we'll be continuing to do this. Uh, the second announcement is that some events are coming up in uh, uh, Adharma Surya next week and the following week. Next week is going to be a, a practice and study a, a, a talk, a teaching on shamatha meditation by Kempo Samdop, which will be very good. And I recommend anybody uh, who hasn't had that to take that teaching and to engage in that practice on Saturday and Sunday. On Sunday, we will continue doing what we're doing here. Uh, so if, uh, if you join the Dharma Surya group, that's fine. This will be recorded and you'll be able to see it again on, on the uh, YouTube as all the others are on YouTube. However, going forward um, after that in May, uh, we'll have a, a later start. I'll have to make an announcement as to when that's going to be because I have to look at the calendar and think about that. But the first weekend in May at Dharma Surya is going to be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is going to be a Mani Drupshan. A Mani Drupshan is one of the most profound of all the retreats, all the practice retreats that is done in all of Tibetan Buddhism. It becomes the foundation of so many other things. So I really recommend everybody to uh, join that who can either by Zoom or in person, especially in person. Um, it's very moving because the mantra is very powerful. It's Om Mani Padme Hung Shri. And um, but the melodies are very powerful, and the um, and the practice that you'll recite or the, that you'll recognize the instructions and so on are so uh, fundamental to all the other uh, practices that we do. So I really recommend that it is a true gift uh, to be able to partake of that. So usually it, uh, the Mani Drupshan is done once a year, sometimes twice a year, and. Um, uh, so uh, that's my second announcement. Um, okay, so unless somebody has another comment or question, we'll start into our uh, talk today. Okay. All right, so I hope everybody has a pencil and paper, take some notes, uh, refer to some things. So I'm going to screen share. Uh, let me see. I want something else here. Okay, so what we have been talking about, if you all recall, is the six human realms. So here is another illustration of that. And we have the six realms that are uh, here in the center. And the very center is the hub. We talked about that. We talked about the outer ring. We talked about that. And we mentioned that all of this is in the grasp of Mara, who is representative of our demons within ourselves that are creating this. We are grasping at this life in these six realms. These six human realms make up this, this life that we have. The Buddha up here in the upper right-hand corner as we face this illustration is pointing to way to uh, Nirvana pointing the way to the, uh, the, the, the Four Noble Truths, to the Eightfold Path, as, as the liberation from this wheel of samsara, this wheel of existence that's being held by um, uh, this Mara, this demon. Now, the one thing that we haven't discussed that we need to discuss today, start to discuss today, is this outer ring that is actually like a shell these are the 12 links of interdependent origination. Interdependent origination. Sometimes it's called the chain of conditioned arising. It's got several different names. Dependent origination is another name. The 12 links of dependent origination. So what this is saying is that these 12 links are interconnected with each other 
and are, is the, 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 the progression that a human being goes through <clears throat> in a lifetime as they are going through the six realms. So the six realms are the, the, um, the ways in which this life is being uh, characterized. Sometimes we feel like we're in a hell. Sometimes we feel like we're in a God realm. Sometimes we feel like we're a human being, etc. And so the way in which we do that in all the different times of our life, the different phases of our life is expressed in these 12 links of interdependent origination. So to understand this is to understand the flow of what our life is. So I think it will become a little bit clearer as we engage in this, although this does require a great deal of, of concentration uh, independently. So this becomes a really good uh, uh, practice, um, meditation practice, contemplation practice to engage in. Uh, so you can find many things online. You can find things in the books that we've recommended about the 12 links of uh, interdependent arising. And um, so to help us to understand this, uh, there is, let me see here. To help us to understand this is a sequential um, linear uh, way of looking at this. Um, here are the 12 links. So first link, you can see them numbered, and each one has a particular uh, functionality to it. And we're, that's what we're going to start talking about today. So we need to establish a few, um, a few um, things like um, the meaning of things. So let me see here. So this doctrine of conditioned interdependent arising, this was taught by Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha, who states that all psychological and physical phenomena constituting individual existence are interdependent and mutually condition each other. This causal nexus, this causal nexus of sentient beings is the explanation of how sentient beings are entangled in samsara. So I can make this, I can put this in the chat, I can uh, email this to you, or I'd rather put it in the uh, WhatsApp so you can print this, so you can look at this later on uh, to consider this. So we need to define a few terms here. So sentient, means to perceive the senses, capable of perception, conscious. So sentient beings perceive the senses. So in the case of being a human being, we've got our eyes, we've got our nose, we've got our hearing, we've got our, our tongue, we've got our, our, our skin, our touch. So those are the five senses, plus the brain that is processing those five senses that is recognizing what the five senses are sending those impulses to the brain so that we can recognize them. So we're capable of perception. What that means is that we can perceive these things happening, that we can perceive and predict things that are going to happen based on our experience. So this is part of being sentient that there's a conscious, there's a consciousness, there's an awareness, there's an awakeness of being sentient. So we say that animals are sentient. We say that insects are sentient. There's many sentient beings that we don't see that are below the ground, that are on the ground, and that are above the ground. So um, as we develop uh, our, uh, our awareness of spirituality, we begin to recognize these different beings that are at these different levels, as we say, in the sphere below uh, the, the, the sphere that we see and above the sphere that we see. So this is all sentient. Causal means to cause, causal, to produce an effect, a motive, a reason. 
So, so all this is the result of causes that have precipitated in actions or the karma that we have created, the, the karma. So these causal, so, so sentient beings are, are here because of their causal, um, um, their causal events to produce their life to give them a motive, to give them a reason and so on. And those things that we can continue to do, the causal things that are uh, bringing us to, to new life, different phases of our lives and so on, and to interact with each other, to interact within ourselves. The nexus is a connection point between the groups of these individual things. So when we talk about the 12 links, the, the nexus point, the, the points of interconnection between these 12 points. So the causal nexus are these interconnected 12 points that we are looking at in a linear, in a linear form here, but also it is in a um, holistic form. <clears throat> this is not a particularly good illustration of that, um, of that, um, um, Inter, uh, the 12 links being interconnected, the holistic, but the holistic would be as if, um, would be as if all those 12 links all come together, but in some points they're connected with three or four other links, but in the center they're all connected together. So we, it's like a shell that we see, that we recognize that is part of who we are, what it, what it is. Let me see if I can go back to that other image here. Here we are. So this this here is like this shell that is going around this center. So this is like a sphere rather than just a flat object here, like a flat circle. It's a sphere. It's three-dimensional. Okay. If anybody has questions, please don't hesitate to uh, to ask. I had a comment. Um, it looks like the the video game Mario Brothers and um, Bowser with the turtle shell on his back. And, and I can start seeing how Mario was even invented. Well, uh, that, I'm sure it's true. I'm, uh, I'm only familiar with the name. I never played the game, so I understand. <laughs> but yes, there's many. You, you find human beings are spiritual beings, whether they recognize it or not. And their spirituality arises in, in everyday life and particularly in the art forms. So I'm not surprised to hear that. that there are <laughs> these themes that run through our lives. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Has anybody else noticed any any uh, uh, examples like that where there's spontaneous spirituality that wasn't premeditated but just happened like that? Okay. Lance, do you call that synchronicity? Is that like what you're describing? That is a form of syn synchronicity. Yes, of, indeed, absolutely. We are yeah, we are spiritual okay. beings, whether we recognize it or not. Okay, so I I do notice that in my life, in ways I hadn't before. I became more spiritual, if that makes sense. Like I, I didn't, it was probably always there. I just didn't know it until my spiritual muscle was awakened. Yeah, it's a question of recognizing. Yes, absolutely. You know, the what, what is it, uh, deja vu? You know, that we've all been here before? Yes. And, and certain, you know, the names may change and the faces may change, but the people, the personalities, the events are the same. They're repeated over and over and over again. And last week or a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the, the transpersonal when we were talking about going through life and, and being able to, to recognize past lives, to, that we had these past lives. And, and I was saying that, you know, I, for myself anyway, that I recognize it through the transpersonal. I can't say that Lance lived any other time than he's living right now. But transpersonally, I can 
uh, have empathy for those beings who lived 100 years ago or, or 500 years ago or whatever, in whatever sentient being form they might have been taking. Okay, so to help us remember that this, uh, these illustrations were for the purpose of being able to present these complex uh, concepts to uh, illiterate people who had good intelligence. They had good intelligence, but they never learned to read and write for cultural reasons and so on. So these pictures all tell a story. So when we learn, you know, what the legend is, how it is that we tell the story, then all this begins to pop open and make sense to us and we can interpret these pictures. So I'm going to go through these sequentially first so that you can become a little bit familiar with them. So this first one is a, a blind man who is walking the earth and he's got a cane. So he doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know where he's been in terms of being able to see things, but he's aimlessly trying to, to find his way through life. So this is the first link. The second link is a potter, a, a man or a woman who is sitting at a potting wheel and who is forming the clay on the potting wheel into objects that can become useful objects. So this is a, a potter at a potter's wheel who is molding his life. The next one here is a monkey who is on a tree that has many different, you know, has fruit and so on, and who is grasping, grabbing at the different fruit who is recognizing the fruit seeing the fruit and this monkey is leaping from one place to another and so this monkey kind of represents our overall grasping at at life to to have a to have an awareness to have a, a consciousness the fourth link is uh characterized here by uh, a boat on a body of water here it looks like a river and there are uh, some people in the boat. I know this isn't a perfect image here, um, but there's uh, a couple of what appear to be passengers. And then there appears to be this one person who is like uh, guiding the boat, who is paddling the boat and guiding it. So so the river is kind of like an analogy for our, our life stream that we're going through. And the boat itself is our is our physical body that we are navigating uh, this this water uh, with this body with this boat, and that we have our senses are within this, our our intellect and so on is our passengers in this boat as we're moving along through all these different uh, things that happen to us during our lifetime. So then the next one here is representative of our senses, our our five senses, including the brain, which would be the sixth sense, but that sixth sense is only processing what the uh, uh, the senses and the sense faculties, the organs are reporting to it. So this is a house. This is an empty house with windows. So the emptiness that's inside the house represents that there's no recognition of what is viewed through the windows. There's no recognition of what it is. There's no, um, there's no intelligence about it. It's just seeing it. So an analogy here would be like a camera. A camera is the lens is just looking at whatever object it's pointed at, but it's making no judgment about it. It's making no, it's giving no designation to it, no name to it or anything like that. It's just seeing the image. But then that image then is, is focused, is produced onto the film or to the digital memory, whatever. And um, so it's like the brain that is recognizing. So we look through the window, we see the house next door, we see the sky, but we don't know that it's the sky. We haven't called it anything yet. We don't recognize what it is, what properties it has. We just see the image. So the same thing could be said about our hearing, hearing a sound, smelling something, tasting something, or touching something. 
So this is the house of the empty house of many windows, represents the senses. Then here is a, um, <clears throat> an amorous couple who are lying in, uh, uh, in, in, in their bed, who are um, having a relationship here, having a sexual relationship, and they are representing contact, that this is um, the beings coming together and, and the contact of the senses is all coming together. So, and along with that, we start to uh, create names and we start to create uh, uh, images for ourselves and, and uh, the, the prejudices and the judgments begin with contact. So this represents that. Then the next one here is, uh, this represents sensation. So this is a man who has a arrow stuck in his eye. And that is an extreme sensation to show that now we are, we are uh, uh, experiencing these physical, these psychophysical things that are happening, and we are having these reactions to these things. So this is a man with an arrow stuck in his eye, is sensations. Then the next one here is a man who is sitting here drunk, who has got a, a bottle of, of Chang, of beer or wine, whatever, liquor, and he keeps drinking and drinking and drinking and can never satisfy himself. So this is representing craving, that we are craving to be satisfied, but yet that which we are bringing into ourselves cannot satisfy ourselves. So we're constantly in the state of craving as a, as a drunk man who is constantly trying to drink. Um, you know, uh, another example might be salt water. You, can, you can't drink salt water and have it quench your thirst. It just makes you more thirsty. <clears throat> so here, the next one is uh, another monkey in a tree now who is holding on to the tree, is holding on to the fruit of that tree and won't let it go. And this represents clinging, the clinging that we have, that we, we hold on to that which we think is, uh, is our identity, that is important, that we need to have, and so on. So this is a monkey holding on to uh, the branches of the tree and holding on to the fruit. Then the next one here is a um, is a woman who is pregnant. So sometimes you'll find that, uh, that, 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 that there's a seduction here that is happening. But here, this is a woman who is sitting here who has a has a pregnant belly, and she represents that we are becoming that something is changing, and that uh, and that um, and that we are trying to understand that we're trying to control that we need to control that so this is being pregnant with the possibilities of of what lies before us and here comes the birth so this is the the woman who is holding on to the branches of a tree which back in the day this was how you know uh women would uh have children would be they would hold on to the branches of a tree and kind of crouch down a little bit and there would be a tendency there that would help the baby to come through the birth canal and would be born like that so this is the illustration of that and this woman is giving birth to an infant so this is ourselves re, re, you know re going through the process of rebirth ourselves that we are birthing ourselves, birthing our new selves. And then the last one, this is the 12th link, is now an old man who is now walking through the countryside and who has this bag on his back. And this bag, if you can see, it's kind of got a human form to it. And this bag is all our, our psychophysical drama that we are carrying with us, all the results of that psychophysical drama. This is all our possessions. This is all our clashes, all the, the results of our karma that he's carrying with us. So this man is, is moving along. Uh, so this represents old age and death. 
and carrying this into the what would be the next life. And then here is the first, again, link of this man who now is going through the countryside, who is blind and has a cane and, and so on like that. So this is the the outer explanation of the illustration. Anybody have any comments or questions about this? Lance, can you go back to the boat? The boat? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, this is their, their um, maybe I didn't quite, this, they're traveling through life. Is that correct? That's the, is that, is that what the boat on the river? Yes. Represents? So, yes. So they're going through, they're going through, they, they, they have a body and they have a, a mind and they're recognizing that and that, that that's what they have to recognize the exterior, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, what life is phenomenal nature. So the water is representing all the vicissitudes of, of that life, all the internal and the external, um, changes, events, things that are happening in our life. Does that answer the question? Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, good. All right, so now keeping that all in mind, if you're taking some notes, so now we go to our linear um, representation of this helps us to understand the meaning of each of these. So this first link represents ignorance, that the blind man going, walking across the land, not knowing where, he, where he's going, represents ignorance, that he doesn't know what he's doing. This is like a child who, an infant, who has just been born. And this, 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 this being, this new human being, this sentient being, you know, um, may not be able to see. It's a question of whether, you know, uh, opening its eyes and being able to see. But the point is, it doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know who it is. It doesn't know what's around them. It doesn't know what's in the future for them. It doesn't know anything. It's absolutely ignorant of anything. It cannot take care of itself. But at the same time, is pure. So the analogy here that we have to look at is a, consider that this is a newborn baby, that this whole experience is the experience of, of a baby who is growing up and going through the different stages of life. So here is that newborn baby who is, is born unable to do anything for itself. And when we can look into its eyes and we can recognize or, or, or we, we get the idea that the, that the baby, the infant, is seeing us for the first time or, or the second time or third time, doesn't matter, but recognizing us and seeing us and, and making that relationship is, is a very special time. And we're seeing that as, as seeing the goodness of that child. We're not seeing a, a nastiness. We're not seeing a, a, um, 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 an evilness with that child. We're seeing just a beautiful goodness that, is being, that has been created and has been born uh, by way of birth with this child, although it is ignorant. <clears throat> so this ignorance is also bringing with it the um, the baggage, if you will, the karma, the kleshas. The kleshas are the aspects of past karma that we bring with us, our kleshas. So they're like the bag, they're like the, the impulses that we have and so on from past lives. So these are, this is previous existence. So those impulses and formations would be the second link that we're bringing with us that we don't recognize yet. They haven't taken any form yet. We haven't recognized them in any way. So the first is the ignorance. And the second are these, these impulses, these formations of these clashes that we're bringing with us. So we're looking at this child 
and we're wondering who is this child i'm sure all parents when they look at at their children like that they say who is this child who will they be you know what were they before they were born why is it they were born this way you know for those spiritual beings might think of it that way people who don't have a spirituality may not think of it that way at all but the, for those of us who do have this uh spirituality we're thinking oh well this is a this is a child who has had a rebirth and they have brought with them these certain proclivities these certain formations these certain uh impulses that um, they're bringing and and now have to um, forbear. They now have to uh, endure in this new lifetime. So these are the first two links of previous existence. So now the next one, two, three, four, five, five links, three through seven, are the present existence the present existence of this being as it develops so first is number three is consciousness that we begin to become aware of things that are happening within ourselves and things that are outside of ourselves we begin to uh, see things we begin to hear things we begin to taste things and we start making connections things are starting to to uh, to uh, form in our in our mind such as it is and we begin to recognize our mother we can hear her voice we can we can um, uh, uh, see her we can uh, taste her we can um, uh, touch her and feel her touch and so on like that so we're experiencing the consciousness of putting these things together the next thing is the mental and physical is we begin to recognize that there is this mental aspect and there's this physical aspect we're not able to break it down into those two things we don't have the intelligence or i shouldn't say the intelligence we don't have the sophistication at that point to be able to recognize well what's mental and what's what is physical but nevertheless these are inputs that are coming to us so these are the the um the uh the things that we see and the things that we think like that we're going to go back over these things so um so then the next one is number five are the six sense object realms so these are the the faculties of being able to uh see being able to hear being able to um smell and taste and so on so it's it's the organs that we have and it's the objects of those things that we are processing and that it is the processing itself within the brain are the six sense object realms so then the next one is contact so now we're we're bringing this together and we're starting to to, to make forms we're starting to make ideas we're starting to bring things together things are starting to form within ourselves so we can see as a as a young infant now you know maybe this is the first couple of months and then this becomes the next couple of months where where the child is developing their personality is beginning to develop um you know um uh, likes and dislikes we're beginning to recognize who this child is and if if you've had a child uh you remember that that um that every couple of months they're going through big changes so this is kind of representing those changes the the recognition of what is happening internally and externally as this child is developing the number seven are the sensations the the events that are happening and the way that it makes us feel the uh the results that we have as a, uh because of that and so these sensations that we are developing and then and then the next one number eight is the craving that we're having and then some of these things we want to have 
some of these things we really like. We like having a full belly. We like having a, a clean uh, clothes. We like being uh, dry. We like being warm. We like being comfortable and so on. So we start to crave those things. And when we don't get those things, then we, we try and communicate our displeasure and we start to cry and, and uh, whatever way that we can to, uh, to let our caretakers know that we're uncomfortable. We we're craving our comfort. We're craving our satisfaction. And then um, number nine is our clinging. We're holding on to these things and we don't want to give these things up. So, you know, trying to take a toy away from a, from an infant or, or maybe this now becomes a toddler. Now it becomes a little bit older, a one-year-old child, a two-year-old child, and trying to take something away from, from that child can uh, drive them into some kind of a tantrum. So, so these, the eight, nine, and ten, are the fruits of present existence. So now we've, we've got these things that we've been developing through our present existence. Now we've got these things that we can hold on to that we're beginning to build an identity. And we hold on to the identity. We crave the identity. We hold on to the identity. And the identity, number 10, is going to lead us, is going to become something else. That we start recognizing um, our older brothers and sisters. We start recognizing our parents are walking around and doing things and speaking. And we want to become this. We want to grow. We want to be able to do these things that we're witnessing and be able to do these things ourselves. And frustration, of course, can come when we can't uh, when we're not able to do these things, or or maybe that our, our, our parents or our brothers and sisters are critical or criticizing us, always saying no to us, you know, things are starting to happen to us that are conditioning our psychology. So, um, so there can be positive reinforcement, there can be negative reinforcement. So all this is part of the fruits of present existence, this becoming. Then number uh, 11 and 12 are the future existence, what we are moving towards now. Now we're getting to be an older child. You know, maybe we're, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, the, the we, now we see ourselves as a, uh, as a developing human being. We can recognize that we're different than from the animals and so on. And, and so we're taking on our, our personality. We're taking on our, our life now as a human being. And uh, so we, it's like we're being born. And we're constantly going through this. So I've made the analogy many times that every meditation that we go through is a death and a rebirth. Because whatever we take into the meditation, then we, we quiet that down and then we, we transcend. If we're truly having a meditation, we are transcending our ordinary consciousness, which is represented by all these other links here. And we're transcending that. And then we're recognizing something that we hadn't experienced before and that now we're incorporating that back into all these things so that new experience is getting processed back through all this sequence of stuff happening. That's why I say it's like a whole on, that all these things are interacting with each other. It's not always a linear thing. So this birth is happening all the time. This rebirth is happening all the time. When we emerge from a meditation, it's we're another person. This talk that we're having today, you know, Hopefully there's going to be some thoughts, some, some something that is going to happen within you that is being triggered by these, uh, by these concepts here, by these ideas, and is going to create a new you. That is now you're going to be a little bit wiser. You're going to be a little bit more understanding of, of who it is to be a human being, what it is to be a human being, why it is that we are a human being, and so on like that. So in all this way, we're, we're reborn as something different than when we entered into this uh, talk. The number 12 is the old age and death of the 
that, that now we're coming through this maturity, all this stuff is happening and so on. We're developing all this wisdom, all this experience, all these things are heaped on us and we're carrying this around like a baggage. We're carrying this around like this bag that, that, is, that is always with us. So, um, uh, so then finally we go through the process of, of the death where we have to either take that bag with us because we're unable to let it go or we're able to put the bag down and we reemerge as a as 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 a totally different being as a totally different being not a human being but a super being if i can use that term so in terms of our Buddhist spirituality, we would say that this is the point at which we become awakened, that we become Buddha, that we put down, that we let down all those things that we have been carrying around, all those clashes, all those demonistic things that have been driving us to have this life after life after life after life. We finally say, I've purified myself. I'm done with this. I can put this bag down. I don't need this bag anymore. Instead of holding on to it and clinging to it, thinking, well, this is what I need to take with me into my next life. So that's a huge point right there. Many people will describe this, this bag as being like a stain being a stain on our spiritual body. So to me, I'd say that this is like the soul. And this is like many of the traditions that say that we have this everlasting, eternal soul. And this soul has is stained. And this stain is all the bad things, all the negative things that we have done. The results of all that and we carry this soul with us wherever we go this is the essence of who we are and this stain stays with us and how do we relieve ourselves of the stain how do we cleanse ourselves of the stain so many traditions are built on that or built on that concept if you follow me if you listen to everything I say, you will be relieved of those stains. You will close, uh, cleanse those stains. But you got to listen to me. You've got to follow me. I'm the only one that can do this for you. This is what many of these traditions are basically saying. I will lead you to, the, to that which will cleanse your stains. You will be forgiven for all this, and you can now have a, 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 a eternal life as this pure soul because the soul has been wiped clean. Maybe so. I don't know. You know, it's, it's a spiritual question and has to be um, answered through a spiritual experience. So the way I look at it, the way many others look at it, is that it's more like this bag, this Alaya consciousness. A couple of weeks ago or last week, we talked about the eight consciousnesses. We talked about that the first six consciousnesses were the sight, the smell, the hearing, the taste, the touch, and the processing within the brain. Those are the first six. The seventh is the is the the car the 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 klesha consciousness the karmic consciousness the i me mine that i'm experiencing all this that all this is all within me is the seventh consciousness and the eighth consciousness is the results of all that process now of the being a karmic being the clashes the results of that that we're carrying around with us in that bag And that, so many people would say, well, that's the soul. But we also can say, well, it's just a bag. And I'm making a choice to carry it around. 
and I can develop the freedom to be able to let that bag go. And that's what we're trying to do. So saying that, maybe you might think it's an oversimplification of the process, but it really is the process. You know, this is the cessation. The 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 four thoughts that turn to mind, excuse me, the um the four noble truths. We talk about all life has suffering. The cause of the suffering is our desire, is our de- uh, our attachment to this life. Then the f- third uh truth is the cessation that the renunciation how do we get rid of this we get rid of it by cutting it off by just saying i'm not going to play this anymore and then the cause of that the cause of that being able to cut that off is the eightfold path this is how we're able to develop the stability in with our spirituality body to be able to have the courage and the strength to be able to endure what we have left in this human life and to be able to say, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for everything and I am going to not have attachment to it and I'm not going to have aversion to it is what we are developing, what we are practicing. So every meditation becomes a rehearsal for that. Every meditation becomes a practice for that. And that's why we say that we can be enlightened in this lifetime. It doesn't have to happen when we die. We're going through a spiritual death. So we can can be reborn as Buddha at 35 years old. Or 45 years old or 65 years old, whenever. Or, Or five years old for that matter. So it's a matter of being able to recognize this very profound process and taking responsibility for it and start developing the skills that allows us to be able to endure and to be able to process and and transcend this human life. Any comments, please? Gary, what do you think about this? Well, I think one of the things I'm hearing is uh, regardless of where you are in life, it's, it's never too late to start. Yes. And uh, I think that uh, one thing I've realized, which I don't know why I didn't think more about when I was much younger, is every day presents many opportunities for, for, for consciousness and to do the right thing. Uh, life presents us with many opportunities to react in the wrong way and in a self-absorbed way and uh, as i look back on my life i i see that sometimes i've done that and sometimes we are conditioned to do that by the environment around us Uh, the environment around us teaches us uh, often uh, not to handle things in a conscious way, in a, in a mindful way. Um, we grew up, uh, at least I did, uh, seeing that, that you handle certain situations in a very destructive way. And they were validated uh, by the world around me. Well, what I saw on television, what I saw in life, and uh, I see now how 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 uh, destructive this was for me spiritually and for others. And um, I wish it hadn't been that way, but that's that's 
that's simply the way it was. And recognizing that is, is part of moving forward. Okay, thank you. Gavin, what do you think about this? Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's kind of like how Gary was saying. It, uh, we can look back at our life and, and assess um, whether we were doing good deeds or, or um, not good deeds and, and how we feel at the moment uh, as we're looking back and what we can do to change and uh, rebirth ourselves into becoming uh, more of a pure essence, uh, behaving to uh, what um, our soul, our, our heart rhythm would rather see uh, in, a, in the light of love, you know. And, um, okay. Are you talking particularly about the bag that we carry? Like how I feel about the bag? that would be carried. Am I asking you about that? Yes. Yeah, I'm asking you about that and everything that we've been talking about here for the past half hour or so. Sure. Um, I was thinking about that bag and it's very interesting that it, uh, it could have be the accumulation of all the past lives and um, and whether or not one wants to release the bag uh, or if they cling on to it. And it's very interesting because that happens every day. And every day is you can carry the bag or you can put the bag down. But, and then it becomes different to think about it at death's door. Um, whether or not you want to obsess about becoming uh, something living again. And, what we perceive in the human mind as uh, a living entity. And like the ancient Egyptians, they thought that the stars are alive and plasma is alive and electricity has life. So uh, that goes into be more explaining of uh, the spirit in leaving the body. Uh, but if the spirit wants to hold the bag, it could get sucked back into material uh, existence into a, a body uh, below the plasma uh, of a star or um, wh where do you go after you let go of the bag? Do you go into what we call the sun uh, or do you go to different spheres in the solar system to become part of the elemental existence on those planets that doesn't have the same Goldilocks zone of earth that allows animals and humans and what we perceive uh, liquids and solids and uh, you know so it's very interesting to me and Okay, good. Thank you. That was very, very provocative. Let me uh, move on to uh, Adrian. Would you like to comment on this? What does this mean to you? Um, that's what it means to me. It's like a guide. It's uh, what? A guide. A guide. A guide, a map, where I'm at every day. Um, and uh, a compass. A I compact? A compact? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're a little muddy sounding. I, 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 I'm having trouble hearing some of the words you're saying. Yeah, compass. Okay. A compass. Um, so it's, uh, um, that's, that's all it, what it means to me. Uh, and uh, the final destination is like you said, um, allowing that person to put the package the luggage down and move on to a higher existence that's what i think 
Is that eternalism? Uh, no, I don't see it as eternalism. Why do you why do you ask that? That well, I'm just trying to qualify the word higher. You know, is it uh, does it mean a a, a more intelligent oh. existence? Does it mean a more um, a, a dimensional, a higher dimensional? You know that there's there's other things to to recognize that we don't recognize in our three dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh... I mean, a, a higher state of consciousness, I should say, right? Um, enlightenment being the the uh, end of the road, I guess. And that would not identify it as eternalism. Okay. But we are going higher and higher with every life that, that, that we have, with every teaching that we have, with every meditation that we have. We're moving higher and higher, and I think that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Matthew, how about you? Would you like to comment on this? What does this mean to you? Um, and I, and I missed a little bit of that. My uh, my nieces and nephews just came here, so it's it's chaos outside. So I'm <laughs> having trouble hearing some. But um, well, a few things. One one question I have is with the the grasping, I think what that you were saying with the the third link, how how is grasping different than like craving and clinging in this sense? Like what's the difference in terms of how the terms are used? Well, that's a real good question. And uh, I, I think the grasping is is identified just in the in the first overall picture of the grasping of of the Mara that is holding this whole experience, this whole wheel in its, gra in its grasp. Hmm. Okay, so, so that demon wants identity. That demon wants the ego. That demon wants this whole experience. This demon is alive with this. The craving is the craving for more sensory satisfaction, more knowledge, more, more identity, the craving for it, the not being satisfied with what one has, but craving even more. So it's going from if, if the, the illustration of the grasping is, is more of a static thing, the craving is more of a of a moving towards something that it wants more, 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 more. It wants to it wants to be heavier. It wants to have deeper. It wants it wants more pleasure, more suffering. It just it just wants more. This yeah. craving of of more life. Mm. <clears throat> so and and then the clinging is is holding on to the results of that, whatever that is. Mm. Yeah. I mean that's how that's how I look at it. That's that's how it's explained in many of the texts. Yeah. No, it, it's interesting. It's a lot. It's a lot to uh, to process, and it, it's always been something that's been a little hard for me. The twelve links of like wrapping my mind about around what exactly it means. But yeah, it's a lot there, and I don't know. It reminds me of some other stuff like in psychology and like uh, like cognitive behavioral therapy and things. That, differences of course where there's like some kind of trigger situation or something that happens and it's like filtered through our interpretation or way of framing it and like we feel a certain way and then that kind of leads to different behaviors that feeds back onto itself at least in that model it's not exact description but i know some of it reminds me of that some too yeah i don't know okay fascinating though thank you Karina, how about you? You know, one of the things that, um, as was being said here, I was thinking that it's like we're we've been seduced. We've seduced ourselves into this this kind of life. What what do you think about that? Um, 
Uh, I try to understand. She's trying to understand the word seduce or seductive so she could conceptualize an answer. Okay, I'm sorry. You, where's your phone? Here. So seduced would be like seduced. that we have been, um, um, okay. <laughs> uh, like tempted in. Tempted, yes. What is that? <laughs> Like the temptation has has pulled us into uh, mm -hmm. into having this life over and over again. Uh, mm, well, second piece. Okay. Uh, it's uh, like all. No, like all these things, what we want uh, from life, like uh, when we're doing not divine things, like uh, when we want some, have a jealous and different, different. Can you feel that, that maybe we've let ourselves be, be led astray, be led a, in a, in a, in a wrong direction. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you see that there's a, um, that we have a responsibility? Mm -hmm. And that if we, what have we given, who has responsibility? You know, what, how do we shape ourselves? How do we make, decisions you know who was the author or who who created the responsibility for us to do this only we are only we are she said <laughs> only we are responsible yeah yes but do you think that there are, are that there are people who have given up responsibility and they give responsibility to somebody else? It's it's somebody else's fault. It's not my fault. Uh, I don't know. I think so. Always, this is uh, like me. Like when we'll follow. It's only uh, we are do this choice. We we have this choice ourselves. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Maybe. Did you have something else that you wanted to say instead of answering my question? Mm, not now. Wait, wait. Okay. Well, Zara, I wanted to ask you too. What do you think of this? What do you think of this? This idea of the seduction and, and the being led astray and giving up responsibility. What do you think about that? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I live it every day with whether or not I get another cup of coffee, but as a, a simple example of another piece of chocolate, um, to the need to grasp onto uh, relationships. Um, for, for all those reasons, I, I, I experience it daily now and I recognize it for what it is. Now, whether I have the skill sets to, I'm still working on letting go of what you call the, the bag, <laughs> the outside and embracing my, school, my spiritual nature. Um, so I, I fundamentally agree with everything you're saying. The practice of it is, is painful, Lance. Doing it in real time is hurts, doesn't feel good. To let it go to those seductions. Do you yeah. think that we have a fear of, of losing something by by making ourselves responsible for for having to put that bag down that we're afraid we're going to lose something in the process? Uh, yeah, it's all ego driven, right? Yeah. It's all like, yeah, it's all, it's kind of like what Matt was saying a little bit about his background um, and like how he deals with his patients, like something triggers something else. So it's the idea of I'm not relevant. I need that attention. Like it's just very, sim it's very simplistic. It goes back to what you 
described as the things that cause suffering. I want what I don't have. I protect what I don't have. Like those four concepts are fundamentally at the root of, of all of these anxiety spheres or these needs, the need to hold on tightly and to cause the suffering and to, and to go back into the, I call it the seduction cycle. Like I got to get back and get that dopamine hit because my ego needs it. Do you use that term? Yeah. Is, that, is that what you usually use? For myself, yeah. Now that I'm shifting plans, when I have moments where I'm like, you're about to do, I talk to myself spiritually now, not conventionally. I, I started to shift my language, my inner self-talk. I'm having a difficult moment. Instead of saying what it is that from conventional language lands, I say, this is, this is you holding on, protecting what you have fiercely i describe it from now a spiritual system versus more conventional behavioral language from my training that's a shift that's happened now in the last few weeks lance it's been great okay thank you yeah zara yeah. That, that what zara what you were describing which is describing the, like the difficult part is is very similar to like what's difficult for me with it as well and that's why, like, I've also trying to be, I think, Zara, you were saying this too, actually, but, like, really, my practice, like, very focused on, like, the four thoughts and trying to break some of that seduction, as you, people are calling it, everything, because there's this, yeah, this feeling with it, and there's this, at least for me, this, like, underlying feeling, like, it's going to work, like, it's going to work this time, <laughs> like, I'm going to be able to do the thing, I'm going to get the praise, I'm going to get whatever it is, or the good feeling, or people, I'm, I'm going to, people are going to think I'm special, or something, and then it's like, as if it'll be sustained, it goes back to the impermanence, like, if I can, I can just stabilize it in some way, it's almost like that thing, I can feel okay, because you do get this, like, slight sense of relief, it's like addiction, you know, really, it's a similar thing, it's like, okay, I got this feeling, and it changes, and it's like, oh, crap, now I got to manufacture it again, and again, and it's just like this cycle that goes on and it's extremely seductive and there's such I mean at least for me like such a momentum to it too that it's just like it, yeah it's hard to to break it at times I think it's interesting and I, I I think Gary you know would comment on this because you know we you know we're the two older guys here the two older people here and you know so for us, you know, death is more real and, and maybe closer, you know, for us, we, we think about that and and the question of the soul and what the soul is and so on like that and and being middle aged, you know, being younger and so on. Life is is so much in front of us and there's so many things that we want to do, you know, to start talking about, well, moving away from that becomes much more difficult. You know, I don't want to do that. You know, but um, Gary, what what do you think about the soul? What do you what do you think about that and letting go of that? What does that mean to you? Letting go of the soul. Yes. Uh, the soul being the idea of eternity, of going on in a different way, is 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 uh, is, is is what you mean. We agree on a de uh, definition of the soul. Well, I guess that's certainly one way of defining it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, I have come to accept uh, uh, the Buddhist belief, which I really encountered many years ago, uh, before Buddhism, of 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 many, many lives, we are sojourners. Uh, uh, in, in consciousness, some people would call it sojourners in time. And I, 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 I believe that now, whether that constitutes um, that is consistent with the idea of the soul, I don't know, but I believe in consciousness. My, I can't go on too long about this, it would take too long, but my first encounter long before I really got into Buddhism was a book 
which I thought about when I began with a saga called Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian Weiss, which you may have read, or some here may have read. I, it is consistent with, um, I believe, with the length and breadth of, 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 of the message of Buddhism. Um, and it would take too long for me to tell you about the book, except that it was, it was about his, his journey with a patient. He was a psychiatrist, totally atheistic, totally empirical, and he had a patient who was having problems and she was your a very average, not exceptional, not dumb person. And when he hypnotized her to deal with her issues, she took him back in time through many lives. And this is a, this is a real thing that happened. It's why he wrote the book. Her name was Catherine. It was not a real name. But I don't believe um, people can define that, you know, within their the notion of a soul. I don't really know what a soul is, but I do believe that we persist through time in some way. And I think that this is what Buddhism teaches, and I think that this is an ultimate truth for me. But that's eternalism, isn't it? Uh, depends on how you define eternalism. Uh, Buddhism that teaches... That we exist, that we continue existing through time. Well, if, if Buddhism teaches that we have many lives, uh, then it is a journey through consciousness. Uh, definitions are befuddling. Well, that's the whole purpose of this. You know, that's that's what part of our contemplation meditation process is about, is, is defining all of that. Everyone, well, everyone, I shouldn't say that. I can't speak for everyone, but uh, there, there's a tendency that I've observed in myself and in others to take a definition and uh, sand off the rough edges of the definition to make uh, it uh, consistent with our comfort level of how we think things ought to be. Well, what do you think about the basic premise? I'm sure I mentioned this in the very early days of talking about this, that one of the problems that human beings have is that they think they know. And they think they can know. Mm -hmm. And every time that we know something is putting another knot in the net. Instead of being able to say, well, you know what? I don't know. And it doesn't matter to me. And can I be happy with not knowing? Can I find happiness in that not knowing? That's a very important point. Um, Zara, go, Zara, go ahead. I want to ask you what you just said is really, really paramount to this whole conversation. What you just said, like not knowing, and are you okay with that? Are you able to do that in your life? I work at it every day. Okay. You know, I work at it every day. And, but at this point now, I'm working at it from the standpoint of how can I communicate that? You know, I've gotten to the point in my life, being as though you asked me, I've gotten to the point in my life where I'm, I'm trying to take everything out of the bag. You know, That's funny. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not seeing the bag as a whole thing. I would like to be able to see it as a whole thing, but Right now, it's easier for me to say, well, I can take this out of the bag. I can take that out of the bag. And then finally, all I'm going to be left with is this empty bag is, is you know, the way I look at it. The bag being your life or your being? The things that I hold on to. The things that you hold on to. Yes. That we keep coming back as a human being. If we look at, at, at this whole birth death cycle thing, you know, the life of a migrator, you know, uh, you talked about a sojourner, you know, being in that boat on that river and having to navigate that river and saying, well, I don't need that anymore. I don't even know what that means. You know, it, 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 to let it go and say, oh, well, that was just 
an experience I had, or that, that was just something I thought of. That was a dream that I had, but it's no longer real. It's no longer relevant for me anymore. It's only relevant in a in a certain set of circumstances. You know, this is the two two truth theory, or the two truths that we talk about in Buddhism: that there is the absolute truth. And that there is the relative truth. We were talking about this on Monday night, I think. The relative truth is all this stuff that we conjure up in our human brains is all empty of any true nature itself. That is like being suspended, if you will, in this absolute truth of that which we cannot humanly explain. This uh, this is very interesting. It makes me think about Neuralink and whether or not a new seductive bag is being offered. And um, that is a very interesting thought because does putting a quarter size uh, like the Matrix, if 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 it becomes fashionable for people to put microchips and and become one with <clears throat> electrodes and artificial intelligence does this stop the reincarnation cycle completely and are why are we at this point in time in the human civilization where we're about to hit a super crossroad of what is called the singularity and whether or not you'd like to get the new bag and when people in wheelchairs are going to be able to walk again, and, you know, like. Well, remember when last week we read the, the, the Heart Sutra. And to put it in terms of the Heart Sutra, it would say there's no bag. There's no bag. There's no bag. So your My point is well taken, but it's another concept. Sure. So so to get to the idea or to the concept that there's no concept. We're just creating things, you know, for the sake of our communication. You know, we're here to have a discussion. We're here to recognize this so that we can liberate ourselves from this. To be able to get to the point to say, there's nothing else I can say or do about this. You know, and I'm, I'm so, so I know how I, I regard this as being, you know, a senior citizen, if I can say that, mm. you guys are young and you guys say, well, how am I going to live the rest of my life with this understanding? How am I going to put this bag down now? You know, and, and so how much of that spirituality do you want to weave now into your present life? And how much do you do you reevaluate what it is that you're doing and saying, well, this is bullshit. You know, I'm just creating this, this, this story for myself to sustain my seduction, to sustain my, my, my story of who I think I am when really I don't know. And it doesn't matter. This is what freedom is, you know, is, or do you think that this is what freedom is or what's your interpretation of what you think freedom is? So this is, this is the essence of what the meditation is. This is the essence of the, the contemplation that leads to the meditation. The meditation is the experience of that which we don't know. So It begs the question, do we have to have that experience to be able to continue the, the conversation with ourselves? What do you think of that answer? <laughs> um, yeah, it, definitely it, we need to. Go ahead, yeah. Adrian, you were going to say? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to say definitely we need to have that experience. And for me, meditation is not necessarily the experience. You can get to the experience through meditation, 
Um, thing meditation is more like a path towards that. Um, and uh, when, when we get there, we, we definitely understand, comprehend all of the things that we were just talking about. Like, you know, why is it so important to leave this, this baggage behind us? Um, but yeah, it is very important to have that experience. Okay. But isn't the baggage the past life accumulation of karma and that has to follow us into the next life? Wait a minute, you just said has. Right, has. So, all right. <laughs> Does it has to? No, according to Buddhism, there's a way to leave the bag behind. Um. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the luggage, it is uh, the karma that we bring in with us. It is the um, past experience and activities that we, we've engaged in in our previous lives. Um, and it's just a matter of how we are attached to those. Right. So this is what I'm trying to point out and, and trying to help, you know, to develop or to give you the tools of, of critical thinking to keep asking what, why, how, what, why, how, you know, and, and the words that we take for granted, freedom, what does freedom mean? What does spirituality mean? So um, why don't we take a break? It's about 1030. Why don't we take a short 20 minute break, come back, and then I want to uh, engage uh, in, a, uh, in a new level of meditation, a new practice of meditation, something mm -hmm. that we've been working up to. And uh, so I want to introduce that with you. And Okay? okay. So uh, we'll come back. It's uh, my clock says 1036. So we'll come back in 20 minutes. So that'd be what, 20 minutes? Uh, is that? Uh, and 36. <laughs> Just call it 11 o'clock last, more or less. Well, you want to call it 11 o'clock? Okay. All right, 11 o'clock, we come back, or uh, whatever time it is for you when it's 11 o'clock here. <laughs> Thank you, Lance. Lance, Lance I have to live. Thank you. I have to, I have to leave, Lance. Um, I'm going to see you next week. All right, well, we'll miss you, but. Uh, Maybe you can catch us up on uh, YouTube because uh, this is good stuff. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Okay. Do a dedication. Oh, that's my okay. guy. That book that I referred to, had you ever read it or heard about it? No. What was it called again? Many Lives, Many Masters. Um, I think that Lori uh, recommended it to me many years ago. I have it downstairs in the bookcase, but. Um, What's the guy's name again? Brian Weiss, W E I S S. All right, very good. Thank you. He, uh, it was a, a fascinating book because this was a total agnostic, or, or, or actually an atheist, and but a brilliant man, a brilliant psychiatrist. And um, before his encounter with her, he would have never accepted the possibility of the things that she described to him. <clears throat> And in, although it's been many years since I've read it, I, the, the, out of, uh, out of the uh, realms of hypnosis, she couldn't remember them either.
but it seems to me that a Buddhist would say, well, of course you live many lives. That's what we do. Okay. It's worth looking into. It changed his life, I think. Yeah, well, there's certainly many, uh, many things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I hope Thank everybody's you, got your. Uh, I'm sorry, somebody I, was saying something. I was thanking Gary for that reference of uh, that book because it sounds amazing. I think you won't be sorry if you start to read it, but you will, it will, it leaves you wondering as it did Dr. Weiss. I haven't seen anything by him really recently, but I haven't really looked because I've been so busy with so many other things. All right. Well, we've got just a little bit of time left, an hour or so. So I want to make the best of that. So uh, we're going to enter into a uh, meditation practice. So we'll begin with what we've learned so far. Uh, we'll recite the uh, short refuge prayer. Then we'll recite the precious human life, uh, the four thoughts to turn the mind to the Dharma. Then we will uh, recall the stages of meditation as we talked about that bodhicitta up to bodhicitta and then we're going to engage in a um shamatha meditation so shamatha meditation requires a little bit of an explanation a much more explanation than we have time for and kempo is going to be talking about this next week so if you really want to take advantage of learning more about it, I recommend that. Um, but we can uh, kind of get right to the point by doing a meditation with an object. You can do meditation without an object. There's many different parts of shamatha meditation. But the, the, the base part is meditation with an object. So the object can be a physical object. It can be a picture. It can be a floor, it can be a, a flower, it should be something, you know, kind of benign, something that when your mind wanders during the meditation, which is going to do, you can bring it back to that object without it um, interfering, you know, with, with your thought process, it shouldn't be anything disruptive or something. Uh, the object can also be a mantra. And that's what we're going to use, something that you can recite over and over again <clears throat> that is a mind protection. Mantra means mind protection in Sanskrit. As we are doing a mantra, as we are reciting a mantra, we are protecting the mind because it has meaning and we're developing one-pointed mindfulness on what the meaning of that mantra is. So in this case, we're going to do the mantra called Om Mani Padme Hung Shri. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. So I'm going to put that up on the screen share when we come to it. So I, I can put it up right now if you want to write it down. So here. So you can see, let me get this out of my way. So here it says Om Mani Padme Hung Shri. That's pronounced Shri. And it says, Behold, the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. So I'll give a little bit more explanation for that when the time comes, when we come to this. But this will be the mantra that we're going to do. Okay. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Does anybody have the copy of their copy of the four thoughts to turn the mind to the Dharma? And uh, to their copy, if they printed it, the guide, uh, the stages of meditation guide one, I'm going to recite it. So it's not essential that you have it. But if you, uh, but for the four thoughts, you should have that in front of you.
Okay. So we begin by reciting the short refuge prayer, which the first two lines are taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha. And the second two lines is bodhicitta. So uh, that one prayer incorporates both. <clears throat> in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye cho dang so ki cho nam la shang ju ba du dagni kab su chi dagi jin so ki pe so nam gi jo la pen shir sangye ju pa sho Oh, this kind of leisure and endowment is supremely difficult to obtain. When one obtains a body which is easily lost, do not waste it meaninglessly, but rather use it to attain ultimate liberation, joyous result. So contemplate the meaning of precious human life. Impermanence. The nature of all phenomena is impermanence. Death is a certainty to all who are born. Death can descend any time like a drop of morning dew on a blade of grass. Quick, it is time to make effort for the essence of the Dharma. Contemplate. the suffering of samsara. In the three lower realms and even in the three higher ones, there is not an instant of absolute happiness. I will avoid the root cause of my samsaric existence and practice the excellent path of peace to enlightenment. Contemplate the suffering of samsara.
karma, cause and result. The fruits of one's positive karma is happiness. Suffering is the fruit of negative karma. The inexorable karmic causation is the mind of is the mode of abiding in all dharmas. Henceforth, practice the dharma by distinguishing between what should be practiced and what should be given up. Contemplate karma, cause, and result. first method to attain enlightenment through meditation is loving kindness. All sentient beings, limitless as the infinite nature of space, have been our mothers from beginningless times until this lifetime. Therefore, for these kind mothers to sustain happiness, it is necessary for me to relinquish hatred and develop loving kindness. The four kindnesses the mother has shown. She gave birth to one's body. She would give up her life for oneself. She taught one what to make up. She taught one what to take up and what to abandon. She performed austerities for one's benefit. These are the four kindnesses the mother has shown. Meditate on the method of loving kindness.
The second method to attain enlightenment is the method of compassion. Even though these mothers desire happiness, by the force of non-virtuous action, they are tortured in the three lower realms. Because of their unbearable suffering, I develop unbearable compassion. Visualize one's own mother suffering in each of the six realms, being tortured by demons in the hell realm, by experiencing hunger and thirst in the hungry ghost realm, being beaten and eaten in the animal realm, suffering sickness and old age as a human being, heedless pleasure and conflict in the demigod realm, desperate falling from pride in the God realm. Meditate on the method of compassion to help our mother in the six realms of samsara. The third method to attain enlightenment is to contemplate, meditate on empathetic joy. May my mothers have happiness and be free from suffering. May they sustain the happiness which is free from suffering. Meditate on empathetic joy.
fourth method to attain enlightenment is equanimity. May my mind abide in equanimity towards these mother beings. Contemplate equanimity. We recite the four immeasurable qualities of bodhicitta. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Again. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. In Tibet. Manam kadam yam pesem chen tam shwe de wa dang de we gurdang dam ba jor chi. Dug nao dang de nao gi gurdang dra wa jor chi. Dug nao me pe de wa dang mi dra wa jor chi. May ring jag dang ni dang dra wei tang nam la ne pa jo chi. The fifth method to attain enlightenment is bodhicitta. Now I lack the ability to bring happiness to these migrators. Therefore, I engage my mind diligently to attain the supreme ultimate state and bring these mother beings to complete happiness. Bodhicitta, the unity of emptiness and compassion. I make effort to practice the ultimate Dharma beyond conceptual thoughts. Bajra Samaza, the indestructible vow that breaks through. Contemplate bodhicitta, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. The action bodhicitta prayer. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this tomorrow, I practice bodhicitta with body, speech, and mind. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind. Where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline but ever increase higher and higher. Bless the mind.
open the heart. Now we'll practice a calm abiding meditation, shamatha meditation. Our body is straight, our back is straight, our legs crossed sitting on the floor or in a chair, our feet are flat on the floor or we can cross our feet at our ankles, whatever's comfortable. Our hands can be relaxed, the left hand up, the right, leg, the right hand lying in the left hand, both thumbs touching, four inches below the navel. Pull the shoulders back, pulls the hands right into the, the abdomen. The head certainly forward just a little bit on the neck. The, tent, the chin tucked down just a little bit. Our eyes can be open or closed. If our eyes are open just to gaze three or four feet in front of ourselves, not staring looking at something quite simple, benign. We close our eyes, there are less obstructions, less distractions at this stage of our meditation. Just stay relaxed. Breathing in through both nostrils at the same time, bringing the breath four inches below the navel. Expand the belly, holding the breath. When we exhale, squeeze the belly, presses against the diaphragm, presses against the lungs and pushes all the stale, negative, dark air out of our lungs through the two nasal passages, through All that dark, contaminated air being pushed out. You can keep your mouth slightly open with your tongue on the roof of your mouth behind your front teeth. If you prefer to breathe through your nose or through your mouth, either is fine. Take a deep breath and hold it. Exhale and hold it. Breathe in. Exhale. Breathe in. Exhale. <clears throat> Stay relaxed and breathe normal. Keep your back straight. Visualize your body, your speech, and your mind 
as being a jewel, a diamond, clear, indestructible. And this diamond jewel is nestled in a lotus flower. It is your legs crossed and your butt on the cushion and the diamond jewel is nestled into that lotus flower. And behold, the jewel and the flower. That is your wisdom, body, speech, and mind. The qualities and the activities of all the Buddhas, all the enlightened ones all the bodhisattvas. And at the center of the diamond, at our heart center, is the Shri, is the primal cause in our heart center, the primal cause to be a benefit to all sentient beings. through this indestructible diamond that is in this lotus flower. The lotus is pure, clean, unstained. The diamond is indestructible, radiant, We recite the mantra in English. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. So now we recite this a mile around in English. Out loud. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. 
Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the lotus jewel. The primal cause. Behold the lotus jewel. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus. The primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. 
Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause. Now recite in Sanskrit. Om Mani Padme Hong Shri. 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 Aum Mani Padme Hong Shri. Aum Mani Padme Hong Shri. Om 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 Mani Padme Hong Shri. <clears throat> Om Mani Padme Hong Shri. Om Mani Padme Hong Shri. 
Mani Padme Hum. Om 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 Mani Padme Hum. Shri. Continue your shamatha, calm abiding medita meditation. Keep your back straight. And continue to recite the mantra in English, Behold the Jewel in the Lotus, the Primal Cause, over and over again. Or you can recite the Sanskrit, Om Mani Padme Hong Shri as the object of your shamatha meditation. Continue your shamatha meditation.
Take a deep breath through both nostrils. Bring it down four inches below the navel and hold the breath. Exhale, squeeze the abdomen, push all that stale negative dark air out and hold the breath. Breathe in and hold it. Exhale and hold it. Breathe in and hold it. Exhale and hold it. Relax and breathe normal. Open your eyes. Okay, that concludes our meditation practice for today. Was that helpful? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Okay, good. Thank you. So we'll continue building on this, this meditation. So this is something that you can do on your own, you know, develop your own personal practice. This is what it needs to be. This is this is what you do exactly as we did it today. The opening prayers, the four thoughts, to turn the mind to the Dharma, the method of uh, the stages of meditation, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, bodhicitta. And next is shamatha meditation. So there's many ways to do the, the shamatha, so we'll become more familiar with that <clears throat> as we move along. Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. All right, so next week we'll uh, continue with uh, our discussion of the uh, six human realms. There's uh, still a little bit more to, uh, to talk about. And we'll continue with uh, shamatha meditation again next week as well. We'll have a little bit of an explanation of the next stage, which is the Vipassana meditation. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And that will conclude this April uh, five-week teaching that we've been engaged in. And we can talk about what we'll do next at the same time. So don't forget that we're going to be using this uh, email or rather this uh, Zoom address moving forward starting uh, tomorrow with Buddhism 101. We'll continue with this and we'll, uh, and the, the Thursday night meditation of uh, Medicine Buddha will continue with this. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. We still need to do our dedication prayers. So don't go away. It's important to do our dedication. The seals the seals the merit. We're not losing the merit. We have we have attained a very high level at this point. We need to seal this. So we recite the dedication prayer on uh, page twenty-one and twenty-two. The dedication prayer by Lord Jigden Sumgun. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas. Divine assembly of Yidams and assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Daikinis, dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. 
May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate word of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara or rebirth as a shravaka or pratyaka Buddha. May all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Mars and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I, in any case, gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Om Ah Hong. Om Ah Hong. Om Ah Hong. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones for the benefit of all sentient beings. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Les. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Lance. See you all. See you, Gary. See you, Karina. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. If you have any questions, I can stay around for a couple minutes. So, uh, thank you for coming.